to begin by testing some of your mem some of your memory. Conjunction, junction. What's your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses. And I see some folks laughing out there. Right, all of you about my age will remember that as the introduction to the educational video from the 1970s from Schoolhouse Rock called Conjunction Junction. And it was designed to run on commercial TV during Saturday morning commercials. That was back in the day when we had to watch commercial filled cartoons on Saturdays. Back you know, if, if you had more than one channel, you got to have a choice, actually. Some of us didn't even have that. But we, it, it was designed to teach children the function of conjunction words. Words that bring other words together to accomplish their, the language's primary obligation or function, and that is communication. And so the question this morning that we're going to use comes straight out of that line, and that is what is your function when we study our, uh, continue our series, why the church is lo local, and looking particularly at the function or work of the local church. What is its function? What is its work? What does it do? And so far, we've seen the focus of the local church is to glorify God by transforming sinners into saints. When you go through the New Testament books over and over, it talks about what it means to be a Christian and then what kind of the impact that has on our lives, what kind of people we become. But included in that is our relationship to one another as a local church. So we are designed to glorify God. The local church is designed to glorify God, and it does so by transforming sinners into saints. And that's why we talked about the focus there in Colossians chapter 3. But we also then talked last week about the form of a local church. What kind of shape does it take? And we talked about the local church being made up of saints, people, individual Christians who have come to Christ individually uh, and, uh, and become faithful Christians, and in doing so, then join themselves to a local congregation. When you become a Christian, you're added to the universal church, but then you have to join yourself to, by agreement, to work with and be a part of a local congregation. And so we talked about the form last week. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the idea of the local church's function. And the function, what we mean by that is simply this. The action or action or, a, or activities a local church is authorized or designed to do, the work that it is designed to do. What is the Lilac Road Church connected together to do? What is its function? What are we, what are we here to do? What are we joined together to do? And the only way we can know what we're joined together to do is to go to the New Testament, go to the Bible. Because that is where we learn what God would have us to do. There alone we find divine authority for the actions or activities of the local church. What its function is. Not from going to the world. What happens is that everybody wants to go to the idea, well, if the scripture didn't say we can't do this, then we can do this. And they come up with all kinds of things to involve local churches in that are not part of the work of the local church, not part of its function. It's important to understand that. So we've talked about the idea here of, of the focus being, uh, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, being on eternal things, spiritual things. We've talked about the form being local in Philippians 1, verses 1 through 5, and we saw how that tied people together to do things in the name of the Lord. And as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to look at the, uh, the primary function of the local church. And I'm going to use a phrase that might kind of surprise you. Because you might be thinking of something fancy, something exciting, something elaborate. I'm just going to say this, self-maintenance. The function of the local church, primary function, is self-maintenance. And you're wondering, where in the world did he get that? Well, in Ephesians chapter. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, actually all the way back in chapter 1, he's talking about all the blessings that we have in Christ. And then in chapter 4, he talks about, beginning in verse 1, about how we are to be unified, we are to be brought together, and the, the ones that he lists there in the first few verses. And then he talks about how Christ is the source of certain gifts to help or aid this church in being those things that God wants them to be. But in verse 11, he says this, and he gave some as a Apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. And so you have these, these various works, these various people that are given to the church 
to do certain things in there. I left all the apostles on the PowerPoint, but they start with the apostles. These are the specially chosen men. Started off with 12, then Judas was uh, betrayed Christ and died, and, and then died. And then you have him, Judas was replaced, and so you have 12 again. But then Paul is added as an un, uh, one born out of due season, as a kind of a 13th apostle. And so he's also a, speci uh, a, a specially chosen representative of God. Given authority to go out and preach the gospel, and what they would teach would be what God had given them. And then they could lay their hands on various people and give them miraculous powers through the Holy Spirit. And some of those would be prophets. So they would put their, lay their hands on men in various churches, and then some would become prophets. Men who would speak the word of God. Some would be evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. So in that first century, they had these people that were able to miraculously speak God's word. And then prior to the fulfillment of the scripture, or the completion of the scripture, so that they no longer were needed. And after the apostles passed away, those things, those gifts began to fade away until they were ended, until we had the full revelation in the scripture. And so what he's saying is that these men were given for a specific purpose. Look at the text again, verse 11. He gave some as apostles, some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And notice these are spiritual works. It doesn't say that he gave some as farmers or some as construction workers or some as doctors or lawyers or other professions and that are great things for people to be involved in. But those were not given to the church because the church isn't a farm. The church isn't a building firm. The church isn't a law firm or a doctor's office. It is a spiritual entity designed to build itself up for self-maintenance as we continue. Let's continue the text. Verse 12, he says, he gives you these things for what? For the equipping of the saints. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. Some of the other versions may say something a little different. But the purpose is, is for the equipping of the saints. So they are designed, these gifts are given to give saints the ability, give them the tools they need to do certain things. These men are the ones that are supposed to be doing all these things. It's the members, the saints are to be doing certain things, fulfilling the function of the church. And these men, these offices, these works were given to give you, the, pre the people, the tools to do these things. For what? For the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And so they are to the, the work of service. It's just the work of ministry. They are to serve one another. And then by serving one another, build up the body of Christ. Verse 13, and you have some reasons for that. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body being fitted together by and fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, that would be each individual supplying, according to the proper working of each individual part, that would be you, each one of us, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so that's where I got this idea of self-maintenance. Comes straight out of the second. It's building itself up making itself fruitful and making itself beneficial to the world by doing what God would have it to do. And so I want you to know some things he says there, unity. In verse 1, 13, he says, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. So there's the idea of unity. So we're to achieve unity, be unified together, working together as one. That's why I say when the church, and when you form a local church, it's by agreement, we agree to work as one. We can't come in here and say, well, I want to do this, and somebody else, I want to do that, I want to do that, and, and then just be all divided because we can't agree on what to do. So there's a unity that is to be found here in the local church. Not only that, there is a maturity to be found in the church. Notice in verse, uh, again in verse 13, and of the knowledge of the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. Fullness of Christ. And so we are to become mature. Got a lot of children out here. 
Eventually, they'll become mature. And when they become mature, guess what? Moms and dads, you'll be old people like us, like me and, and all the ones who remember Schoolhouse Rock. But maturity, but you then hopefully will be mature and be in a position of leadership because of the maturity that you've achieved by the self-maintenance work that's being done here at Lilac Road or wherever you might be a member or where you attend and worship. So he's wrapping up this the idea of these gifts with that, the maturity, then there's stability. Notice in verse 14, as a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by, and carried by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by the treachery of men by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So we're stable. When the church's job is to create within us a stability so that when some preacher begins to say things that sound a little, well, that doesn't sound right. And we'll be able to maybe, it may take a little work and it takes a couple, oh, I'm admitting that sometimes I hear something that doesn't sound right. It takes me a while to figure it out. And it's a struggle sometimes to really get through the logic of it. But the stability says I'm not going to be drawn off or knocked off of my feet. By the, uh, by the waves of these false doctrines. So it's the stability. And he says, there's copy. I like the word copy. Use the word copy there because in verse 6, 15, he says, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. So we are to become imitators of Christ. We are to become copies of Jesus Christ, taking on his image as we speak love and truth, or truth and love. And then we are to multiply. We are to get bigger and stronger and better. Verse 16, from whom the whole body being fitted together and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. That every part doing its job. I don't know if any of you watch you know, the NBA. You know, they just had the finals. And I watched a little bit of it. I, I used to watch it thankfully back long ago. But anyway, I watched a little bit of it this year. And, and again, I was just amazed by watching the ability of these players to drive the queen, especially some of them that were just special, just extra special. They make moves that just leave your jaw hanging to the ground, basically, because of their, of their ability. And you look at them and you don't say, man, that guy's got an impressive Achilles tendons. Or that guy's got impressive anterior cruciate ligaments. The only time we talk about those ligaments is when they blow one out. But we see it. But those are the parts that are working together to make that person capable of doing those things. And so when all of us are doing our part, we make the church capable, able to do its work, to, to glorify God and transform sinners into saints. That's a that's that transformation process where we become transformed or changed from the sinners that we were in the past, the people who still struggle with sin, to the kind of saints that are glorified and are in Christ, in Jesus Christ. So everyone does a part. And that's why we, we make such a huge deal about Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. That's why assembly is such a priority for Christians. Joining together. It's not the assembly itself. The assembly would be the church, the people that make up the church, and, and that's important. But in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, he's not talking about the church per se. He's talking about brethren making it a priority to be with brethren in the assembly. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Not, thinking, not forsaking our own assembling together. So the act of joining together with brethren, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So the idea there that he's talking about is that, that we are thinking about each other. We come together because we think about each other. We are concerned about each other. We want what is best for each other. We want each other to grow. We want the other brethren to be stimulated to growth and to maturity and to unity and to uh, the identity of Christ and copy Christ. That's what our goal is. That's why we're here. We don't come, uh, hopefully, I don't, and I don't think anybody does that. I don't, I, hopefully nobody here is here. Okay, so I can, I've been to church. I can check off my, my uh, list, to do list for the week I've been to church. If that's your only reason for being here, 
I'm glad you're here because I'm going to tell you that's not the reason you ought to be here. You need to be here for a better reason. You need to be here because you want to serve God. You want to glorify God. And that's why we meet on Sunday twice. We have Bible class, actually three times. We have Bible class, and then we have the worship period, and then we meet again at five. And then we have a midweek Bible study. We have things like the ladies Bible class that was just on last Thursday night. Then we have a gospel meeting coming up in two months, which is two months away with Bob McPherson. Those are the kind of things that are designed to help us grow. And being here and being a part of that encourages one another and stirs one another up to good a love and to good works. And that's why we have Bible studies and sermons rather than chat sessions. I mean, it, it would be a waste of your time and a dishonor to God if I walked up and said, well, what do you guys want to talk about today? I ain't got nothing to talk about. What do y'all want to talk about? Oh, you know, how's, it, how's the Lord been treating me this week? No, we, I, we should have those kind of conversations. But that's not what the worship is about. We have sermon. And it's not a pep rally event where we're going rah, rah, rah. She's just come by, you know, jump, everybody jump and shout and have a good time here. And go out all thrilled and excited and, and sweaty. That, that's not it either. That's not why we're here. We're not here for, as one person put it one time, I thought it was great. He said, dinner and a show. That's not what we're here for. Which is why, if you'll turn over to 1 Timothy, just a little bit before Hebrews, Paul left Timothy in Ephesus. He's told at Timothy to stay in Ephesus and gave him some work to do. And it was all spiritual work. It was designed to help the church build itself up in love. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Paul says, As I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on in Ephesus, so that you may instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. Nor to pay attention to myths and eat endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God which is by faith, but furthering the teaching and uh, honoring of God in His church. That's what they're supposed to be doing instead of arguing and debating things that mean nothing. And get people just distracted and cause disunity. Then he says, You're to fight the good fight. Then in chapter 1, verse 18. He says, this command I entrust to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered ship a shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, so that they will be taught not to blaspheme. And so he is to get busy teaching. He's telling Timothy, you have a, you have a job to do within that church. Get busy doing your job. Get to work. You have a function. And your function is to bring together people together in Christ. So get busy bringing them together. Then in chapter 4, he says that, that their job, his job, is to teach people the way to heaven. Look at chapter 4, the first Timothy, verses 11 through 16. He says this, prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your usefulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to the exhortation and teaching. So you get busy teaching, get to work. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which, by the way, nobody knows what it is, never revealed, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on the hands of the presidents, so they have been given to them through God, through the Holy the Apostles. Verse 15, take pains with these things. In other words, go through the struggle to make it happen. Be absorbed in them. So be busy in it so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear. So he's not getting out there to be heard and just say, well, I failed, I, I, I failed 30 minutes or 45 minutes or whatever it is in the sermon. Uh, and so he will be right with God, and so will those who hear him. That's his purpose. That is his goal. So they teach the way to heaven. And then also, I'll just throw this one in here, uh, support preachers in chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. They support preachers. This is you want to know where the church gets the authority to give money to a preacher for preaching for them? That preacher network, 
right here. Verse 75, verse 70 and 18. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And Paul uses it in other passages, talking about just preachers in general, not just those who are elders. This is what they're to work. This is what they're to be doing. Now, in case you're wondering, here's where we get the authority to have this building. We have a nice, comfortable building. You know, I'm going to see somebody fanning a little bit. I think somebody turned the air down a little bit. But anyway, it's a nice, comfortable building. It could be outside where it's sweltering. It could be out in the field. But assembling, which is something that we are not to forsake, requires a place to assemble. Now, it could be out under a tree or in an open field. Bob and Terry have a wonderful field. We can just sit out there in their, out there in their backyard and have services there. About five Sundays in a year. The rest of the time, it'd be too hot or too cold or wet or something like that. So we have this. And so it can be on a rented facility. It could be, you know, you could all drive to Bowling Green. We can have services in my, my basement. That's a pretty good-sized basement. Uh, be a little tight, but we could all get in there and have worship there. Or in a building purchased by the funds, the pool funds of the church, which is what was done here. I'm thankful for climate control and soft cushion seating. Also, when he talks about singing, we are to sing as part of the self maintenance and this, this worship that takes place. We're to sing. That's where we get authority for song books and for other things that are associated with that teaching and that part of the teaching is when we have the authority for a separate Bible classes and for teaching supplies and things like the books that have been ordered for the Romans class. Those things are all provided and authorized by scripture. And I say that because it's very important to understand that. We need to understand that when we, when we look at right around at the things this church purchases for its use, it better have authority for those things. It must have authority for these things. We can't say, well, I, you know, what, the, yeah, I don't know, but just do it. No, it better come from Scripture, and that's what we get. Now, one of the problems that we run into is a lot of people get upset about church buildings because people can go overboard, right? They get a little crazy with it. You know, and, uh, and, and just get expensive, fancy structures that are just way beyond the necessity that they are designed for, the pur purpose that they're designed for. Years ago, um, I was serving as elder. This would have been in 2007. Yeah, 2007, 2006 and 7. We, uh, Palm Tree Drive in Orlando was uh, busting at the scene. We were pushing 200 every Sunday. And we started talking about expansion. We have heard the always joyful subject of expansion. And we hired an engineer and an architect. They even went to a county board meeting together, authority to, uh, to change the, uh, to expand, uh, and so forth and so on. And by the time it was all said and done, they gave us the authority to expand the building for 50 more people. 50 more people. Because of, and mostly because of parking. And that would require us buying three lots and joining us from, from homeowners who might not want to sell. But in 2006, anybody remember what the housing market was like in 2006? It was way off the chart, higher than it is now. And so we would have had to pay a premium for houses because of the market. We would have had a premium because we would have had to persuade people who didn't necessarily want to move to buy, sell and move. And by the time it was said, by the time we finished looking at it, it was going to cost over $2 million to expand our building to see 50 more people. Now, there's no price tag on people. But the other elders and I all looked at each other and said, this is absurd. This is absurd. Now, that's just, that's beyond reasonable. And so we didn't do it. And thankfully we didn't because in 2007 the market went and we lost 50 members because of the construction industry was such a big part of that area. We lost 50 people leaving to go find work. So, yes, churches can get out of control and go crazy with building. And, and they do. But abuses 
Don't negate the authority. What a lot of people want to do is say, well, we just can't have the buildings at all because people go crazy. Well, yes, people go crazy, but that doesn't mean we can't have a building. And again, I'm thankful that we have one. I'm thankful especially for this lovely projector that works so well. Again, thank you, Steve, and, and Ray, for putting that up. The, all of that was purchased through the pool funds that you have put together in your Sunday, regular Sunday contribution that are authorized by 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through 4. So that's, that's self-maintenance from the standpoint of the teaching and so forth. Now, let's look at one other thing about self-maintenance, and that is the authority for caring for needy brethren. It's also a part of the self-maintenance. If you have a local church where there's sufficient funds within the local church and there's members that are starving or don't have a place to stay or things happen to them where they have need of help from the brethren, we have authority for scripture to do that. Look back at Acts chapter 2, the very earliest days of the church. We have this marvelous example of the church there taking care of its own. Beginning in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. And so when you have brethren who genuinely were in need, yeah, not scripture is very clear, not people who just don't want to work, but people who are in need, and that happens. And we have to be generous and kind and loving to those people. We have the authority to do that. Though, even that has its limit. Again, if there's somebody that doesn't work, they'll feed them. And they can work. If they can. If they can. Again, if they can. And even then, if there's short term, short term help is fine. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and we won't read all of that, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16, Paul talks about helping widows. Typically, widows would be the most uh, unable to provide for themselves, folks. And he said, verse 3, honor widows who are widows indeed. And then he begins, he begins talking about how they can be taken into uh, the support of the church full time in verse 9. A widow is to be put on the list. And the indication of the list would be those who receive daily, regular, full time support as their need, because of their needs. And he puts a limitation on that. Only if she is not less than 60 years old having been the wife of a woman. So she has to be a faithful Christian and she has to be young enough and old in that time beyond the age of being able to provide for herself. And of course, Pastor Johnson talks about that if there are family members that can take up care of these folks, it is the family's obligation to do that. So even that care has limits. But it's important that we be sure that we're willing to take there was, a, I was a member of a church years ago in another state, I won't even say where, that I'm, I came to the conclusion that if I needed something, if I had a, a financial disaster, the last place I would go would be that church that I was a member of. Because they would want to see every, they would want to go through the house and say, well, you know, you've got, you've got two sets, you've got five pair of shoes. Sell three of them. I mean, that was the kind of mentality and mindset they brought to it. We have to be generous. We have to be kind and thoughtful of brethren. So that's an important part of self-maintenance is caring for one another. But even though self-maintenance comes first for every local church, that doesn't mean we hide ourselves away from the world in some kind of monastery or compound. To the extent it can, or the ability that church has, it should look outside itself to brethren elsewhere and to the world. Last week we saw in Philippians, if you turn back to Philippians chapter 4, we saw in Philippians chapter 4 that the Philippian church sent money to Paul in a number of places. In verse 15 he says, you yourselves, this Philippians 4 verse 15, you yourselves also know Philippians that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. So right after he left Philippi, they sent him money when he was down in Thessalonica. But they also sent a man named Epaphroditus to him, and this is who brought this letter back to Philippi, a man named Epaphroditus, who had brought support to them, or to Paul, from them, while he was in jail in Rome. 
So they were reaching outside of themselves to provide aid to Paul in other places. And so that's something that we can do as well. Another story. All right, I'm sorry. I'll make it quick. When, we, when I was in Orlando, there was a church that uh, at one point had 500 members, and in the process of time, the elders managed to kill the church. And we got members from that on a successive wage coming out of that congregation as they just continued to throw people out. And finally, it got to the point where they just were going to have to dissolve and sell their building. So they did, and they sold it for a couple million dollars. And they came to us. And offer, made an offer to take up the support of preachers. We were supporting a number of preachers because we had financial ability to pay for it. So. And they said, we would take over their support so you can do your building expansion. And we said, no, we're, we're not going to do that because our work, our money is dedicated to supporting preachers, not to building a huge building. And, and that, would, that would tie us together in a cooperative way that we just were not, didn't think really was scriptural in the first place. And I looked at the elders and I said to them, here's what I would do if I were you. You want my thing. It's free. Take the money, get a list of every preacher you can find in the state of Florida, and then spread out from there every preacher you can find and send them five or ten thousand dollars till all the money is gone. Just send it to preachers. Gift them with that money so that the gospel can be supported and, and brethren can be encouraged in other places. Main elder looked at me like I had lost my mind. You know what they ended up doing with all that money? They created a trust so that they can remain in control of the money. And that trust, if you've ever been involved in those, those are just, just difficult as, as can be in actually getting money out to somebody who needs it. But that's what they did. Because they wouldn't think of others in in and a way that's willing to turn loose of the control of it. And as you, and we didn't read 1 Corinthians 16, but if you remember 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 4, it was taught to go outside of preaching and to, to the idea of supporting and helping people in need. The collection that was being taken up in the Corinthian church and in other churches was for the needy saints in Judea and in Jerusalem. So it, Jerusalem had got to the point where it could no longer maintain itself. It could no longer support its members. It could not do the self-maintenance. And so they were being, they were, brethren elsewhere were pulling, pooling their money and sending it down to them to help them. That's what he said in 1 Corinthians 16. And then I want you to notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 talk at length about this process. And it says that they are to we give as we are able. And verses 12 through 15, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 12, it says, For if the readiness is present, he's talking about this contributing money, that's where this instruction about building your money on the first day of the week. If the readiness is present, it is acceptable according to what a person has, not according to what he does not have. So don't, don't do what you can't do. But do what you can. Verse 13, for this is not this is not for the ease of others and for your affliction, but by way of equality. At this present time, your abundance being a supply for their need, so that your abundance also may become a supply, their abundance also may become a supply for your need that there may be equality. As it is written, he who gathered much not have too much, and he who gathered as little had no lack. And so what you have here is you have these folks. Having an abundance, they contribute, they help. They send funds to help others. When you have people, and then it turns around, that, that may turn around. In a fluid society, it may flip. And the congregation that had the abundance may need help. And that's where the connections and recognition of other brethren come into play. But again, th this is limited to brethren. The one thing about this, is when we talk about this, is limited to brethren from the local churches. And it's according to ability. But what's important to understand is that individuals have much greater freedom in what they can do. And are instructed in Galatians 6 and verse 10 and in James 1 verse 27 to be generous in helping those who are in need. The congregation has limits. Christians as individuals have some but much fewer limits. Well, let's wrap this up with some takeaways. Let's wrap this up with some takeaways. 
First thing we want to do is we want to say this. Glorify God by doing his work his way. Look at Philippians chapter 1. We won't go back to that again. Do it his way. Fulfill the function that he has given us. Second thing, support your local church. And by that, I'm not talking about putting money in the box back there. I'm talking about being a contributor of time and effort and involvement and engagement in each other's lives and not forsaking the assembly of yourself together, but also in reaching out and being a part of each other's lives and encouraging one another that way. And then last thing is pursue unity with a passion. Passion for unity. That's what we're to do as servants of Christ. Well, this church, the Lionel Road Church, is organized at the local level because its sole focus is to glorify God by transforming sinners into saints. And it's formed by you, local saints, joining together by agreement. And this function is building one another up in the faith so that we can demonstrate Jesus in our daily walk. So go ahead, go ahead and get your song book out. We're going to ask a couple of questions. A couple of questions. Speaking of the Lilac Road Church of Christ, ask yourselves, because you are the Lilac Road Church. Ask yourself, how are we doing in fulfilling the function God has given us? Are we building ourselves up the way God wants us to so that we can go out and do the work God wants us to do individually as well? But more specifically, how are you doing? Are you fulfilling your part? Is the church growing because it can depend on you and rely on you? Perhaps you're not a Christian. Perhaps you need someone that become, needs to become a Christian that wants to be a part of a local congregation. Well, first thing you got to be a Christian. That means you got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Repent of your sin, confess his name, and then be baptized in water. Where you get the old man that you killed when you repented, and then arise as a new Christian to serve him, to be transformed from a sinner into a saint who serves God, and then join yourself to the local church to be a part of it, helping it build itself up in love and in good works. We can help you do that, or if you've done that and you need some encouragement or some help or some uh, whatever it might be that will help you be better and closer related to God and to your brethren. Come. Let us help you do that. Come on, Mr.